Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of the Sports Inside with your host Alamdar Khan. And yes, we always review sports information from all across the globe. You guys can surely reach out to us on the social media handle which is at the rate of Indus New Sports. That basically works both for Twitter and Instagram. But anyways, we'll go to the headlines first. Yes, Afghanistan actually earned their empathetic victory of 48 runs on the first T20 International against Zimbabwe. And yes, from the world of NFL, Patrick Peterson is moving from the Cardinals to the Vikings on a one-year $10 million deal. Yes, and from the world of football, Champions League, yes, Chelsea, see off Atlanta, Madrid to reach quarterfinals. And yes, from the world of sailing, Team New Zealand retains the America's Cup in front of thousands of spectators. And yes, those were the headlines and surely we'll be talking about the world of cricket to begin with. And not to forget that Afghanistan actually managed to get that amazing victory. Uh, they've surely been performing super well against Zimbabwe. If you look back at the test side, it was pretty awesome. And now they managed to win the first T20. But anyways, to discuss the world of cricket, we have with us Benedict Bermanj all the way from Bristol. Thank you for joining, sir. Pleasure. All right, so we'll start with obviously uh, the victory uh, that took place for Afghanistan and how Afghanistan has finally come out of nowhere scoring and hitting like, um, you know, it has been super perform performing, you know, the, 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 the team itself to be precise. Let's take it that way. I mean, like the way they have come and Zimbabwe is obviously going down. So we'll start with this and we would love to hear your take on it. Well, it's an amazing turnaround, really. Um, the first test match was one-way traffic for Zimbabwe. Right. Um, and I must admit, after, the, after Afghanistan disappointed so much, um, they really looked to Rashid Khan to perform in the second test match. Right. And perhaps surprisingly, it was the batsman who really did well. Hashmatullah, Matullah, Asghar Afghan did particularly well and really batted Zimbabwe out of the game. Right. Um, Rashid Khan, special nod to him for the test match. Uh, Afghanistan enforced to follow on. And I can remember back in uh, the late 90s when Murali bowled uh, Sri Lanka to victory against England, right. bowling pretty much non-stop throughout two innings. Rashid Khan did pretty much that and uh, came away with 11 wickets and a fantastic a series levelling victory for Afghanistan. And uh, they managed to carry forward that form into the first 2020. Um, it was the batsmen this time. They really put the game to bed after 15 overs, 150 for two. Um, right. Rama, Ramanullah batted superbly and everyone knows what uh, Rashid Khan can do in 2020 cricket. True. <clears throat> but, you know, um, it's so surprising to see them playing on a very positive level now because initially, like you said, the first test was not up to the mark, but then came the second test and they were all in. They said, finally, we will show uh, what we're capable of doing. I think the batting lineup is super, super phenomenal now. And obviously there are more tests, more T20 is coming uh, their way. What do you see uh, with regards to this tour? Who will actually be coming up with flying colors? I think it's interesting um, to look at how the first test match went. Um, obviously, the Afghanistanis don't have much experience with playing five-day cricket. They right. clearly um, didn't take long to uh, acclimatise to the conditions um, after the first test defeat. Right. I think um, look now quite a few of the um, quite a few of their team, you know, Rashid Khan, we've mentioned, um, Mohammad Nabi. They're both pretty high up in the ICC rankings. Right. Um, Rashid Khan for bowling, Mohammad Nabi for all-rounders. I think it's going to be tough for Zimbabwe for the remainder of the series. Um, they've got to take early wickets, which they failed to do um, in the first game. Uh, so um, they re And then the batting needs to fire. I think Af Afghanistan definitely in the ascendancy, and I think Zimbabwe might be a little bit worried with how the rest of the series might go. Right, right. I'm sure it's killing in a direction that you know any team would definitely get kind of worried because it was only the first test that they managed to win. But anyways, we'll switch over to uh, the next interesting journey of England versus India. I would love to have your take on it because of the fact that, you know, uh, the test situation, we'll start with the test situation of England versus India, and then we can jump on to uh, the T20 side. Right? 
Well, the test match, I think everyone was surprised how England started. Joe Root led from the front. It was his 100th test match. Um, managed to score a double hundred in the first game and led England to victory. Right. And uh, obviously there was an additional pressure. There was a place in the World Test Championship final up for grabs as well. So certainly um, after that first test win, England were, had every reason to, be, to feel positive. Sure. Um, however, things went sort of rapidly downhill from there. Right. Uh, they struggled to pick up the, the spinners and the, the, the last three test matches ended in two days, three days and four days. Um, and really didn't go the way of England at all. They they struggled to pick up Aksar Patel with his uh, variations and Ashwin, well, he always performs with bat or bowl. India didn't really need their batsmen to fire other than uh, Virat Kohli a couple of innings, but he didn't make a century. Um, the standout innings was Rohit Sharma's magnificent 150, but the batsmen didn't really need to perform. England's batsmen really did all the hard work for them. True, true. But talking about the, uh, I'd probably see it more like an unpredictability. Because if you remember, when when it was uh, in India was touring Australia, and you know they were all out for 36 in their test, and then they made a superb comeback. So I think that's exactly what kind of situation happened for them in in, in India, where England started, you know, with that amazing start, but then it came up to a halt. So now, in, now definitely, India is at the point of definitely having the home ground edge which we always believe and it was a very interesting match even if we talk about the last T20 match uh, how do you see because obviously England is now leading and if we talk about the world standing of the ICC T20 teams it, these are the two top teams how do you see it further developing I mean it's been interesting um, there's been a lot of talk certainly in England about the importance of the toss in these games right. all three matches the captain has chosen to bowl first all three matches the team has won um, I think the if you look deeper than that, um, India twice they've made terrible starts to their innings. They've made two of their four worst ever power play scores in this series. True. Um, and I think they've struggled to cope with the extra pace of uh, Jofra Archer and Mark Wood up front. Um, India, without Jasper Bumrah, they don't have anyone really to counter that. I, I looked at the stat, England bowlers have bowled the fastest 86 deliveries in the 2020 series right. uh, so far. Um, that's been a big difference. And uh, when the pressure's been on, KL Rahul's been out of form, so they've always been up against it early on. Um, whether it's a case of win-toss, win-match, I don't know, but certainly it's been the case so far. But I think it's England's bowlers have been able to put the extra pressure on the Indian batting, especially early on, so that they're always playing catch up. Even in the last game, Virat Kohli played superbly. In the last five overs, he scored 49 off his own bat, but they were always up against it. They were only on 87 after 15 overs. I think this entire journey of in India versus India will surely get to the interesting level. Um, my take with, with regards to how you just said, you know, it all depends on the toss. <clears throat> if you were following PSL that happened in Pakistan, I'll just give you a quick verdict on that. Obviously, it came up to a halt because of the COVID 19 situation. but. Exactly, that's exactly the spell that happened in Pakistan. Anybody who used to win the toss and, you know, uh, elected to uh, ball so that, you know, they, they can... And it, the, for people who were actually scoring, um, you could easily come and chase it. And all the teams were chasing the score. It was, it was all on the toss till the last match because the last match that happened was the only match in which that spell broke. However, the COVID-19 pattern came in. I look back, I mean, there was a lot of discussion on this, and I look back over every single 2020 match played ever, and it's 52% are one chasing, 48% are one batting first, which is pretty much as you'd expect. Right. Um, I perhaps expect even more so chasing, but it, I think it's been this year especially, it's been skewed. Right. I don't know whether it's the due conditions, um, whether it's a geographical split. Again, we'll be interested to see how the tournament plays out in England this right. summer. But obviously conditions are somewhat different. Um, one, there's been some talk of playing games in the daytime to eliminate the fact that there's due. Um, but then I don't know how TV execs uh, would react and whether they get any crowds in for daytime games. Um, but certainly this year, there's been a lot of talk, certainly uh, in the PSL and now in this series, about win toss, bowl, win match. I mean, Owen Morgan, the last 17 tosses that he has won, right. he has chosen to bowl. 
Interesting, interesting. That's a very good statistical analysis. Uh, besides all of this, uh, Benedict, I would want your wisdom with regards to uh, the COVID-19 situation and the players going into the isolation and going through the entire bio-bubble process. Because if, if, if you remember when Proteas were here, uh, De Kock could not perform the way he could and the team could. You know, they actually collapsed even though they came winning from Sri Lanka, if, if I remember. But they came to Pakistan, they weren't really informed. Even though Pakistani COVID-19, you know, isolation is not as uh, strict with regards to the situation and the bio uh, bubble, but you know, he came, he collapsed, and you know, there came a statement saying that you know he's on a mental health break because he just cannot take it. So how how will players in the future be courageous enough to face this? It's very difficult um, as there are two viewpoints. One are. Well, you know, one viewpoint is you know, they're professional athletes, they're playing for their countries, they're paid handsomely for what they do, they should be able to cope with these things. Right. But then again, they're, they're human beings. Lots sure. of them have families, young children, and it is difficult. You know, I, I could work away quite a lot in the summer. It's very difficult. I've got, I've got two young boys. It's, it's difficult for me being away just for five days. Right. Um, but for them to be away, and it's not just... Um, being away and being able to soak up the culture. You know, I went to Pakistan back in 2003, covering the New Zealand tour there, and I was lucky enough I could go up into the Murray Hills, I could you know, soak up the culture, eat in the local restaurants, which is all part of the experience of touring. Um, unfortunately, for the last year, even when teams have been able to tour, they haven't been able to have that, so they're not getting the full kind of rounded experience. It's literally, especially in the UK, um, where the teams were actually staying at hotels at the grounds, um, they wouldn't see anything other than the ground for extended periods of time. And then even when they went home, they'd have to isolate um, and be in quarantine for, a, for you know, quite an extensive period of time. So it is very difficult. Um, hopefully it's a situation that will not be repeated, certainly not in my lifetime. But it, you know, we're still is, hoping. We're still hoping to, you know, maybe uh, come up, come up to a solution of the COVID-19 pattern. Because, to be very honest, uh, the sports world is definitely affected with regards to the entire uh, pandemic situation. Uh, even now, we've, uh, like PCB has said that you know we'll continue the PSL, but the way it is still growing out there, the COVID situation, it's it's very technical. I don't even foresee what will be the situation by the end of the year. It's very difficult. I mean, we, we just don't know. We're, we're fairly fortunate in the UK. Last summer, we managed to get an entire international season without without any problem. Well, right. without any issues, really. Um, all the matches were played. Um, yeah, I've, I've spoken to, I live in Bristol, I speak, I've spoken to the uh, guys who work at the county ground here and they're not sure what the crowd situation will be so they can't it's very difficult for them to put any financial projections in place um england did just play new zealand in two test matches in june there may be crowds for those possibly reduced crowds and then by the time india come in august hopefully there might be increased numbers um the vaccine's being rolled out i'm i'm waiting my turn right um but yeah so hopefully it will um hopefully the situation will resolve itself eventually. right uh, let's hope all goes as per plan. And you know, I just have, would want to have a quick uh, take on Babar Azam. He just grabbed the third position on the ICC T20 ranking. Uh, what, what's your quick take on Babar Azam? Oh, he's a, a beautiful player to watch. Um, I've been fortunate enough to see him play in um, all forms of the game. I remember I was at Lords when he when he was injured a few years ago. It's a great disappointment of everyone in the commentary box and in the ground. Um, it's lovely when players are successful in all forms of the game right. and he is clearly focused on test matches, one day matches and 2020 so it's always good to see players like that riding high in the, in the world rankings. Right, that, uh, thank you very much Benedict for being a part of our show and sharing your wisdom. Pleasure. So yes, so that was the world of cricket with regards to uh, Benedict himself and yes he gave us enough wisdom to share with you guys. Uh, we'll take a quick break and once we're back we'll follow up with the show. See you guys after the break. And yes, welcome back after the break. And yes, we were discussing obviously cricket and its updates, but we'd surely switch over to the world of NFL. Yes, there have been a lot of trading going on with regards to the NFL itself. 
Uh, a major trade that's happening is Patrick, Patrick Peterson signing up with the Vikings for one year, one year deal worth 10 millions. And not to forget that he was with the Arizona Cardinals. But anyway, to discuss more on the NFL side, we have an expert, Neil Reynolds. Neil, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. This is um, this is always uh, the busiest time of the NFL offseason. It's uh, it's a bit like the football's transfer deadline day in reverse. It's uh, all the teams are trying to sign those players that are uh, free agents and out of contract. So it's been a very busy few days. Uh, um, lots and lots of signings across the league. Right. So um, let's talk about the first signing. As you said, you know, you're talking about this is the right time for the signing of different players who are actually available. We, we start with Patrick Peterson. Him being with the Cardinals, it's been like over a decade now, but uh, obviously he had a downfall in between in 2019. But right now, he's up uh, up for the signing uh, right now with the Vikings. So how do you think this would uh, affect the Cardinals? Not only them, how would it affect the Vikings? I think the Cardinals lose some leadership. Um, but he's a player who's been around, like you said, for, for a decade. He's been with that uh, Cardinals team for a long time. Um, his play probably has slipped a little bit. Um, he's a good example of uh, desperate teams maybe overpaying for players. Uh, so the, the Vikings spending you know, north of $10 million on, on Patrick Peterson is a, is a gamble. But he's a, he has, I guess, been a proven player. Uh, the Minnesota Vikings were very poor on the defense last year. so. Um, they are kind of desperate. That's where they're making this move from, a position of desperation. Um, and when you're desperate, you can overpay. And I think they may have done that with Patrick Peterson. The, you know, this is the danger with free agency. You look at the name on the piece of paper at this time of year, um, can look very impressive, but it doesn't match up to the player you see uh, on the field. So I have to see how this one plays out. It's a bit of a gamble from the Vikings. As you mentioned, yes, it sounds more like a gamble because having this one player and paying this much amount of money, how much the long-term effects would be. Uh, talking about this, if we go back two years with his uh, um, the, the situation that he got, got himself into, into where he got suspended, uh, was that one of the major reasons maybe that, you know, uh, Cardinals had this thought of maybe letting him go? I think it, I know, I think it's purely a an age and a financial decision. So the NFL works with a salary cap. So every team has, uh, well, roughly this year, about $180 million to spend on players. Last year, that was about 20 million higher, but because of COVID, uh, the financial impact, um, there's less money to spend. Uh, there's also a, a scale as you go up in years, you get paid more in the NFL. Right. So Patrick Peterson probably just became too expensive for the Arizona Cardinals. This is a, uh, a young man's league, a young man's game. Uh, teams are always looking to get younger and cheaper. So I think he's just a victim of that. Um, he's fortunate to find a team that's desperate and needed to uh, needed to fill their defense because he's been paid pretty handsomely. But it's more about the fact that it's more a financial thing. These teams are struggling to get every player under their salary cap. Um, and some of the older guys, the more expensive ones, they can be cast aside. Right. So, uh, not about this, of course, like you said, that you know, there's a lot of uh, switching, trading happening. So, we'll just discuss more on Van Noy for now. Um, how do you see that uh, he's returning to New England's Patriots? How do you see that happening and working for him? So, Kyle Van Noy is a very interesting example of what can happen in free agency. So, last year, this time last year, he signed a four-year deal with the Miami Dolphins, moved from the New England Patriots to the Miami Dolphins, right. signed a four-year deal uh, for pretty good money. And after one year, the Miami Dolphins had said, he's not the player we thought he would be. Right. We're going to move on. So we're going to we're going to get rid of Kyle Van Noy. Um, right. Now, New England, they know him. They know what kind of player he is. They know how he fits their formations, their tactics, their system. So for them, it was very easy to take him back. But it, I think the fact that he went to Miami and only lasted one year, is again a kind of warning sign of what can happen in free agency. You do have to be careful. Um, but a very tough defender, very gritty, uh, very reliable, um, a perfect player for the New England Patriots. I'm sure they uh, were very quick to welcome him back. Right. So, uh, and the last uh, person that I'd want to discuss is Hes uh, Heston Reddick to begin with. Uh, $8 million. As you said, as the players grow older, with regards to that, the teams want more of the younger lot. How do you see his trade coming in with the Panthers for a year? 
Well, yeah, I think the important is a year. I think some of these players only want a one-year deal because they want to get back to the open market when there's more money available next year. Right. Uh, I think the teams are happy to take one-year gambles on players. Um, he's one of those who he exists to chase around quarterbacks. Anyone who knows the NFL, NFL knows the stars of the NFL are the quarterbacks, the people right. that throw the touchdown passes. They're the ones that get all the headlines. Right. Um, his job is to disrupt that. And there have been a whole bunch of players at his position in free agency this year who've made a lot of money. Um, he goes to a Carolina team that's got very young defense, um, very good defense, and a team that's kind of growing under head coach Matt Rule. So uh, he can he plays at a position where you, you maybe don't have to use as many tactics. It's see the quarterback, chase the quarterback. Um, I think he can make an instant impact. I'm interested to see how this one pans out. All right. Um, one interesting question, obviously, with regards to the world of sports, which is almost happening everywhere. What exactly or how much did the Corona and the COVID-19 situation impact the NFL as a league itself? Yeah, it certainly did. I mean, the NFL were uh, pretty incredible with their player testing. They kept their entire season on schedule. I think they had fewer than 1% of players testing positive across the league and players were tested on average each player was tested around 200 times during wow. the season um they they started on time they planned for the super bowl on time at the beginning of february that all went to schedule they didn't lose any uh, any entire weeks of the schedule they wondered if they would have to add some and push the super bowl back they didn't of course they lost uh, in stadium revenue but the nfl has a great package of TV deals. And yes, they've taken a hit, but they're positioned, I would say, as well as any sport and any sports league to bounce back quickly. Uh, they've got new TV deals that are on the horizon that are going to be announced any day, could potentially double their TV revenues. Um, right. So yeah, they took a hit like every sport, um, but they kept going, they stayed on schedule, um, and I think they bounced back quickly. Right. Uh, the last question that I would be more interested in would be how much did it affect the players obviously when you have a, a filled up stadium with all the crowd cheering you know the enthusiastic per, 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 you know situation to be honest but obviously NFL is making money the other way how did it impact maybe the performance side of the players yeah good point and, and I spoke to some players that during the season and at the end of the season and, and American football I suppose any sport any elite sports this way you, you, you feed off the crowd, yeah. you, you know, you get energized by the crowd. And <clears throat> some of the players said that it was a real, it was a real struggle to kind of get up and get to that really high level of performance because they were playing in front of empty stadiums. Now, some teams and some states had uh, limited crowds, but there were some that were completely empty stadiums. Um, and that was, that was hard for the players. It's an emotional game. It's a physical game. It, it requires a lot of, a lot of excitement and uh, yeah, it was definitely an impact uh, in that sense. We we actually look at it probably from a business side, from a right. from a dollars and cents point of view. Right. But when you think about the for the players, they were uh, they were going through a lot emotionally. They they couldn't get together in the dressing room. You know, they weren't spending much time together. Uh, they weren't uh, they weren't really a team. You know, right. until it came to game day, and and that's a big part of sport as well. Indeed. Well, Neil Reynolds, thank you so very much for being a part of our show and sharing your wisdom with regards to the NFL. My pleasure. Pleasure. So that was Neil Reynolds obviously talking about the NFL side. It's definitely an impact with regards to the coronavirus situation. But anyways, I think we really had uh, the talk of the wisdoms and the trades that he talked about. Anyways, we'll quickly switch over to the, to the next news, which would be from the world of football. I'll just give you a quick brief. brief. Yes, Chelsea actually managed to beat Atleto Madrid by 2-0 on Wednesday. And not to forget that they have finally reached the quarterfinals of the Champions League. And remember that, you know, in the Premier League, obviously, they're also going up and up and up. And definitely with time, uh, they're improving their performance. And I think they will definitely be, be rising up to the charts. Let's see if that mag magical Thomas Tuchel managed to bring them to the finals. Yes, that was from the world of football and a quick take on the world of sailing. Yes, America Cup sailing. And as discussed earlier, New Zealand definitely was struggling with regards to getting there. But yes, they have managed to defeat the it Italian outfit Lona Rosa by 7-3 on Wednesday. And it's the fourth time that they've managed to lift the mug. 
And not to forget the team, New Zealand has secured a 46 second lead against the Italy in their home waters. Anyways, this was pretty much the updates with the gossip post from all across the globe. You guys can surely reach out to us on our social handle, which is at the rate of Indus News Sports. Till then, take good care of yourselves and bye-bye.